I'd like to welcome you guys to the top emerging business technology for today. I'm pretty excited. I get really excited about technology because it, it's happening so much in this day and world and it's changing the way that we live. I have to tell people I chuckle um, because we went to a virtual environment in the blink of an eye during the pandemic. And so what it shows is that the power of technology to keep the world moving, because in the past, it probably would have, pandemic would have made us stop and we didn't, so it's pretty exciting. Um, so I just want to say thank you guys for attending. Um, and we're really excited to get started. Um, here's what we're going to talk about is I actually have a list of the 25 top business technologies that are occurring. But what I decided to do instead of just talk about them, I decided that it would be good to actually see a video of them and to see and to have a discussion of how they relate to the rest of the world. So this is going to talk about the top five. So let's get started. This is my list of the first top 10, the Internet of Things, robots, robot process automation, electric autonomous vehicle, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, machine learning, voice interface and chat box, big data and augmented analytics, 3D printing and additive manufacturing, and cloud and edge computing. Now, in the tech world, we argue about which one's number one through 10, but we all have them on our list somewhere between one and 25. Let's talk a little bit about- Things is changing much about the world we live in. From the way we drive, to how we make purchases, and to even how we get energy for our homes. Sophisticated sensors and chips are embedded in the physical things that surround us, each transmitting valuable data. Data that lets us better understand how these things work and work together. But how exactly do all these devices share such large quantities of data? And how do we put that information to work? Whether we're improving the production of a factory, giving city residents real-time updates on where to park, or monitoring our personal health, it's the common Internet of Things platform that brings this diverse information together and provides the common language for the devices and apps to communicate with each other. The process starts with the devices themselves, which securely communicate with an Internet of Things platform. This platform integrates the data from many devices and applies analytics to share the most valuable data with applications that address industry-specific needs. Let's start with a simple example, a car. After taking a long road trip, Rebecca notices that her check engine light has come on. She knows that she needs to have her car looked at by a mechanic, but is not sure whether it's something minor or something that needs immediate attention. As it turns out, the sensor that triggered Rebecca's check engine light monitors the pressure in her brake line. This sensor is one of many monitoring processes throughout the car, which are constantly communicating with each other. A component in the car called the diagnostic bus gathers the data from all these sensors, then passes it to a gateway in the car. The gateway integrates and sorts the data from the sensors. This way, only the most relevant diagnostic information will be transmitted to the manufacturer's platform. But before sending this organized data, the car's gateway and platform must first register with each other and confirm a secure communication. The platform is constantly gathering and storing thousands of bits of information from Rebecca's car and hundreds of thousands of cars like hers, building an historical record in a secure database. The manufacturer has added rules and logic to the platform. So when Rebecca's car sends a signal that her brake fluid has dropped below a recommended level, the platform triggers an alert in her car. The manufacturer also uses the platform to create and manage applications that solve specific issues. In this case, the manufacturer can deploy an application on the platform called the Asset Management System. This application oversees all of their customers' cars on the road, as well as all the parts in their warehouses. It uses the data from Rebecca's car to offer her a potential appointment time to service her car, directions to the nearest certified dealer, and a coupon for the service. What's more, the app will ensure that Rebecca's brakes are covered under her warranty that the correct replacement part is ordered and then sent to the dealership so it is ready when she arrives. But the manufacturer's analysis does not stop there. They have also deployed a continuous engineering application that tracks not only Rebecca's car, but hundreds of thousands of others, looking for ways to improve the design and manufacturing process of the car itself. If the same problem in her brake line crops up in a critical number of other cars, the manufacturer uses applications custom built for the automobile industry to pinpoint the exact problem. They can see if these cars were made at the same factory, used the same parts, or came off the assembly line on the same day. So what do all these pieces add up to? Streamlined inventory management for the dealer, a better, safer car from the manufacturer. And for Rebecca, 
it means she can be back on the road faster and get to where she's going safely. All thanks to the Internet of Things. And we thank IBM for that video. And that's not something that's happening in the future. That is something that is actually happening today. That, that process has been honed down by Delphi Automotive. And that's what they bring to General Motors and a few of the other original equipment manufacturers. But now, for some cars, you don't even have to go into the dealership. They are able to upload the software to your car and make whatever update while it's sitting at your house, which was such a big deal when they announced it a couple of years ago, um, but now it's standard fare. So it saves you a trip to the dealership, it saves you time and energy, and, and the software gets updated very quickly. But that wouldn't have been able to happen without the internet of things. So that's, that's my top, my top, on my top number one list. Number two, robots. Robots are everywhere. More places than we can ever, ever imagine. And so I am excited to see some of the robots that come down and the revolution of robots that are coming. And the first one, let's talk about delivery. Delivery took on a, a interesting importance during this pandemic because most of us would have died without it, whether we were delivering from Amazon, whether we were delivering food, whether we, whatever was being delivered and shipped into our houses and businesses and kept us alive. So let's look at this first drone drug, drone delivery of Amazon. Amazon just completed its first real drone delivery. Richard Bree ordered something, and one lucky customer in Cambridge received an airborne package last week. And Amazon made this video of the delivery. It took 13 minutes. Well, the drone-based delivery is part of Amazon's big bet on autonomous air based delivery. Amazon calls it Prime Air. Amazon tested the Prime Air service on December the 7th using a nearby drone equipped, fully automated to receive an order and a package. It takes off after traveling down an automated track. It uses GPS to plot its delivery and return to home base. It will carry packages up to five pounds. Now the test began in Cambridge, England. But here's the exciting part. Last year that test began to happen right outside of when Amazon Prime Air in Canada hasn't gotten approval to be tested in the United States just yet, but it's coming. And just imagine how efficient life will be when the packages come straight to our door with no problems. Then the next one is called Robot Process Automation. And this one was interesting to me and I just wanted to be able to talk about that a little bit. This is courtesy of Deloitte. Robot process automation is autonomizing human activities and tasks. One minute of work is equivalent to 15 minutes of a human's task. And see, they've broken down the task into small pieces. And usually it's a simple process. And it's not always manufacturing. Sometimes it can be marketing, sometimes it can be legal, HR these days. And this process is is pretty office oriented. So imagine someone going through thousands and thousands of invoices and reports and a robot doing it rather than a human being.
imagine a company sending out a million invoices and normally it would have taken them a hundred people to do and now it just takes one robot on a personal computer. We never really talk about robotic process automations, but those are probably happening faster. You're finding now that companies can do advertising with the robot process. They can do market research. They can do legal research. They're doing all types of tasks that used to take a lot of human beings, but now it just takes a, a, a couple PCs and some software. So that, that to me is really interesting. But someone has to manage that process if it breaks down because it becomes quite traumatic. And then number four, which is my favorite, which is home, electric and autonomous vehicles. Now people go, why would you put them as number four? That's why we have a lot of argument around technology. And I have to remind people that the, the automotive industry right now supplies 60% of America's jobs. And not just normally the, the OEMs like Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler, Fiat Chrysler, but all of the suppliers that they rely upon to produce a car. But let's look at this autonomous vehicle and new robot. This is Ford's new delivery robot called this Digit. This is Ford's two-legged delivery robot. It's called Digit. Ford is working with Agility Robotics to create autonomous deliveries. Once a self-driving car arrives at its destination, Digit will unfold itself from the back of the car. Then it'll grab the correct package from the vehicle and walk straight to your door to drop off the package. Digit was designed to look like a human and walk like one too. Our goal with Digit is to have a robot as a mobility platform that can be in human spaces, go where people go, and uh, work with people. And there are so many applications uh, where that's going to be a useful and important um, task. One of the big ones is package delivery. A robot vehicle that can drive on all of our roads. Is this is Ford's two-legged delivery robot. It's in a few stereo cameras, which is what many self-driving cars also use. The autonomous vehicle can wirelessly deliver information to Digit. This exchange of information can help Digit use the best pathway to the front door and overcome unexpected obstacles. We'd envision the AV to arrive at the site with all the information you'd need to know about starting a mission. Uh, we'd have the prior maps and the AV would uh, be able to aid the robot when it got out of the vehicle in knowing where it was and where it needs to go. And uh, additionally, the AV is full of sensors and computers that can uh, help the robot, which is a, a little bit uh, thriftier on those components. And uh, should it run into any difficulties in uh, package delivery, uh, we can either solve the problem on the car or we can relay that information up to the cloud for further assistance. This also keeps Digit super lightweight and they allow for a long runtime. Ford claims Digit can operate most of the day. No word yet on when Ford expects to send Digit out on its own or where it will first launch. So would you answer the door if this rang on your doorbell? And that's right here in our backyard, which is exciting. And then to round out my top five is cybersecurity. And we're gonna talk about the businesses. We talk about cybersecurity a lot, but we never talk about the business of cybercrime. And it's a real big business, a trillion dollar business to be exact. Let's talk about it now. We use technology every day 
in our lives for everything. People just expect the lights to be on. They expect to be able to turn on the tap and for water to come out. You're activating about 250 different microchips in the modern automobile. Every machine that you get connected to in the hospital, the banks, your credit card purchase. We're also seeing appliances that have become internet -made. Technology is just becoming the fabric of the modern world. We are becoming increasingly dependent on it. Dependent on it. People don't realize that behind all of these systems, there's computers that were probably built 20 years ago. Surf's up. See you on the net. All of those computers and software are deeply insecure. The standard view of a cyber criminal is some 16 year old pimply kid in his mom's basement hacking away at a keyboard in between playing World of Warcraft or Call of Duty. But it's changed. Today it's actually a business and it's run by traditional organized crime groups and new modern organizations. They are global, they're multinational, they're multilingual, and they're operating 24 7. If you shopped at a Target store on Black Friday, your credit card may have been affected by a massive security breach. If you are a victim of a car theft, you know that your car is stolen. You can call the police, they can look for it, etc. What's different about cybercrime is it happens in the background. And by the time you actually realize it, if you ever do, it's way too late. You can see the hacker is actually working in my computer right now. 99% of the people who have been victims of cybercrime don't even know about it. Their machines have been hacked. The bad guys are living inside your computer. They're monitoring what you're doing. According to the latest studies in 2014, the average time to detection is over 200 days. And that doesn't matter if you're a mom sitting at home or the major corporation in Silicon Buenos Aires, and from there they're going to hop to a computer in Italy, and from Italy they'll go to London, and then they'll go to the bank that they want to take over in New York. And what that means is that now you have an international criminal investigation, and the evidence is incredibly ephemeral. For some parts of the world, the whole concept of cyber and internet and computers is so new, they have absolutely no laws against cybercrime. If we don't have a legal framework that allows the countries to cooperate, then the victim can't do much about the attacker. We don't have a set of frameworks that address the full range of cyber hazards. The technology is developing way too quickly for us to rely upon legal instruments to fix this problem. Beyond that, most of the world's information is not encrypted, whether it be your credit card number or your personal data or your health records. Anthem Insurance got hit by a massive electronic attack. The hackers made off with many of the necessary tools to do a whole lot of damage to a lot of people. We have the attackers running very, very quickly, and it's very difficult to defend against them. The real challenge for all of us is really, do I feel safe in this online environment? There's never been a better time for exponential change in the cybersecurity world. I think that the next big technology should be the creation of a safer internet. And I just want to open it up for questions. What do you think about some of that technology? Hello? Yeah, what do you think about the different levels of technology we just, the top five that we just talked about today? You know what? I just joined in. Okay, then that, you're not the person then. Anybody else who's been on the line? So, so what's the entry? What's what's the process of entry level? Not to be an an employee, but to be an owner of these type of companies, so we can um, grow economically in our communities. Of understanding that that technology is growing, how do we how do we position ourselves to to move forward with um, contracting and things of that nature? I was so first of all is to identify what areas are changing and changing fast, like in the last video. They talked about cybersecurity and there's no laws. So there's a lot of development going around as it relates to uh -huh. cyber laws and being able to tighten it up that, that process and to be able to have a physical process that relates to cybersecurity and the law. Secondly, sometimes just learning the skills and being around the population who's making those changes because there's a lot of changes going on and there's groups of people who are always needing 
to, to discuss those changes and how they're going to implement them. And so you need to be around those forward thinking people. But in order to know who they are, you have to study the, the craft of the, of the area. So say, for example, for us, we've been learning a lot about cybersecurity, we've been learning a lot about the Internet of Things, and we discovered in having a conversation with one of the consulting firms that they actually have a demonstration center called Accenture Innovation Center right here in Livonia that people come from all over the world to see what the Internet of Things looks like. Now, it's been here about four years now. You said it's in Livonia? It's in Livonia. And it's called what now? Accenture Innovation Center. And it shows you all the different aspects of the Internet of Things. So, so in order to take advantage of the opportunities, you got to know what the forward-thinking opportunities are. And no matter <clears throat> where you are in the world, there are groups of people who are moving things forward. So when I went to visit the Innovation Center, it was a couple, years, a couple years ago, and it was just mind blowing. But to know that it was here and that somebody in Spain knew it was here and I'm sitting right in this backyard and I didn't know it was here is just amazing to me because you have to, you have to stay on top of things. Number two, a lot of times contracts come from people that people know. I would say most contracts come from being knowing people. So that means you have to situate yourself in different groups that may take you out of the comfort zone. I can tell you, honest to God, because I'm in this tech world, I end up going to a lot of events where there are no Black people. And initially, that bothered me about 15, 20 years ago. Now I expect it. But I stay in those groups because they teach me a lot of things about what's going on in the world. And they also provide me access to potential opportunities. And so I think that if you're going to be an owner, you, you got to be able to not look at what's happening today alone. You have to say, okay, what's happening five years from today? And then go find groups of people who are going to help educate you on what those things are and how they're going to flow. So what type of certifications is there that you think are your top three certifications to get when you're talking about um, technology? Um, some things that you can get your entry point in a door. So then if you want to be an owner and an operator, you have the mm -hmm. lingo from taking those classes and, and mm -hmm. be able to, you know, sharpen and hold your skills. Because oftentimes you know, people mm -hmm. want to own some things, but they don't have the certificates and, and, and that type of thing. Well, I would say right now, the, the leader in the internet of things and the internet in general is Cisco systems. Pretty much every major corporation in the country either has a Cisco system or Juniper networks because they control all of the internet hardware. We provide Cisco certification as a network technician engineer, as a cyber ops, as a Linux developer, and then soon to be what we call a DevNet, which means a Linux and a Python developer. Whatever you do in the technical space, you have to almost justify who you are by your certifications. So whether you're looking at the internet certifications, whether you're looking at developer, certifications, whether you're looking at data, data analytics certification, that industry is running by certifications to say, this is what I know. And there's lots of opportunities. In our next top 10, which is six to 10, we have big data. Now I put big data a little further down on the list. A lot of my colleagues and I argue about that because all of this technology is driven by data. But what has happened is a lot of things are moving from hardware to software and then to data. So a lot of people have not picked up the data, but it's coming. Ida, can I interrupt you for a minute? Sure. I wanted to make a statement or tell a little uh, anecdote about the um, certifications. Sure. Uh, I, I uh, got my graduate degrees from U of D Mercy in cybersecurity and software engineering. And the head guy over there, the dean of the cybersecurity part of the college at that time, um, had a meeting with me because I was going through the program successfully. And he told me that he wished he had have known me prior to my graduate education because he would have sent me to Cisco. He said, Cisco, you get the basic information that you need for cybersecurity and you get a credential. He said, and that's the place to start. 
so now here, even after I've completed my graduate education, I found myself going back to Cisco to get the Cisco certifications. So I think if you were to start there, you would find yourself way ahead of the game because the Cisco training um, gave me answers to a lot of the questions that I had as I went through my um, post-baccalaureate and graduate educa education that no one there seemed to be able to answer. So it is a good, solid education, and it is a good, solid, meaningful certification. And the reason why I talk about certifications is because oftentimes that is not discussed in our community. It doesn't matter whether you're in Cisco, which is network engineering or cybersecurity or data analytics or software programming, many of those certifications do not require a degree. Now, if you're gonna start in business, the best place to start is to be able to have skills to be able to offer to people. And I use a good example. Um, I was having a conversation with a guy who actually does Ericsson and Nokia networks. He puts up the lines, the actual cabling for those. And he's been able to support himself for the last 10 years. He makes, his company does a little slightly over $2 million a year and he's just pulling cable for cell phone companies. And that's because he has the skill to do that. So a lot of times when we look to do business, we're, we're, we're looking for how, how do I get the skill and how do I justify that I have the skill? And certification programs to me are the best thing to, talk, to, to get the skill and to demonstrate that you have it by completing the exams. But what I found is that we very seldom ever talk about those programs in the black community. And so we want to talk a lot about them because there's a lot of different programs that are there, particularly as it relates to technology, that whether you're going to go work for someone or whether you're going to go work for yourself, that the certification and its, it's, and it's impending exam passage is what tells people that you have the skill to be able to service them, whether it's at a company or whether it's at your own company. So I think that to me, the certification is the place to start. The second thing that I've noticed is that most of the certification bodies tend to group themselves together. So they come together and they have conferences, they have meetings, they're always talking about their industry. And I tend to go to a lot of those and I don't see a lot of black people there either, even though those certification programs don't require a degree. And that's how you find out information about what's happening in the industry and how things are going to proceed in the industry. And I'll give you a good example. Um, we talk a lot about 5G. And, and that's on my number six to 10 list. And so I went to a meeting and as I'm at the meeting, I'm sitting and talking, they're talking about how they're, they were having a discussion about who's going to get the contract to manage all of the vendors for 5G in Southeastern Michigan. Well, that vendor who got that contract is actually out of Chicago. And so he hadn't gotten the, the, the contract yet, but everybody in that industry knew that that bid was out and only those people in that industry. So they only had like two or three people who bid on it, right? And so I asked them, well, how are you gonna hire the people to do the work? Because our work borders that work. So we were one of the first companies to start having this conversation and hopefully knock on wood, we'll have something to report in a couple of months and, and that dealing uh -huh. with that entity, but going to the different trade meetings as it relates to that area gives you advance notice of things that are occurring before the rest of the world knows about them. Uh -huh. And so I tell people, be a, a committee of one, even though you may be the only one who's there, don't be afraid. Take the time to go and see what the industry that you're interested in is doing and kind of hang out with those people. The second thing that I discovered is that when you hang out with them because you have a common topic and theme in mind, they tend to love you because it's so rare. And so I go to those events and I just, I have picked up so many friends who are willing to give you so much information because you have something in common together and it's the topic matter. And particularly if you're very knowledgeable in it, they tend to have great respect for you. So I tell people, don't be afraid. And there's a lot of those organizations here in this area. You have things that are related to connected cars, that connects the technology. You have things related to 
aerospace that connects aerospace to cars. You have things related to the Department of Defense that connects it to technology. You have a lot of those type of activities in Southeastern Michigan. They may not be on the mainstream list, but if you dig in the technology, you'll find all type of activities that occur that relates to the different subjects that relate to these emerging technologies. In fact, last year, they had the first IoT conference here at the Science Center. And it was very, very well attended. The irony of it all, the event planner who's over that conference is not even from Michigan. They're not even from the United States. They're actually from London. So you find that there's a lot of technology things that happen here because of the automotive industry. Uh -huh. You just have to clue yourself into, okay, what am I interested in? Go find those organizations, go find out what type of certifications or what they use to, to justify that they know the knowledge and just get entrenched and work at it and, and be consistent with it until you, you, you develop um, some connections there of getting to contracts or in our potential jobs. I find that people think that because we're in the United States, because we're in America, that we are number one in everything, that we're ahead of the game. In cybersecurity, that is not true. In cybersecurity, London, the Great Britain, is head and shoulders above us in that particular field. And anyone who wants to go and get immersed in it, that is where they go to start to meet who they need to meet and find out what they need to find. So when you're searching for information and when you're searching for um, topics or, or directions to head, don't just limit yourself to United States learning with the Zoom um, the, the Zoom apps that they have in the different industries, you can go anywhere in the world now and get the information that they have, look at the projects that they are building in that particular community or environment. So I'm just saying don't limit yourself to here. When you go looking for information, look everywhere because there is valuable information to be had, little nuggets of knowledge that come out of other environments. Okay. And I'm going to agree with that because I'm going to tell you what I've discovered um, on my LinkedIn because I've, I've been trying to hit as many people in different industries. There are places that you wouldn't think that are technological powerhouses that have now stepped up to the plate, like Poland. Now, I would have never thought of Eastern Europe as being a technological powerhouse, but there are a lot of technology that comes out of Poland. Same thing with Israel. There's a lot of technology that comes out of Israel um, because what happens in this new economy, skills is where people flow. If you have the skills, businesses, contracts, and people flow to you, no matter where you are. And that's what makes this economy so different than any economy in the history of, of America is that people flow to skills. So we're in what I call the age of skills. And it doesn't matter whether you're, whether you're in the U.S., doesn't matter whether you're in another country, doesn't matter whether you're in the inner city, doesn't matter whether you're in the suburbs. The skills is what is making things happen. And so I tell people, concentrate on your skills and your credentials because they're everything for you because that's where your opportunities are going to flow from. Anybody got excited about the digit for robots since that's in our backyard? That, that was going to be my next question about to ask, um, how do we find out what is it cost prohibitive to go into that business? Because we know we have a large uh, population of seniors. We got those baby boomers that are still out here. That's going to be mostly retired this year. And for them to get around, it's going to be a little harder because they're not going to be able to afford their, the insurance on the vehicle and the debilitating opportunities of driving. I'm sure they're not going to purchase a, a new autonomous vehicle. So the delivery system is going to be a, a, a opportunity for us to get into because of what's going on. And a lot, of, a lot more people are working from home. So they're going, to, they're going to say, well, I'd rather save this money for my retirement than buying a vehicle and those kind of things. So how let do me, find Let me jump in here, okay? As a baby boomer, that is not true. Okay, that is not true. Do not count people out well, because well, they have a high number. 
in their age or because you consider them retiring and whatnot. Nobody I know who is in my age range is just retired and sitting at home. Everybody is working. Everybody is out there. My best friend right now was talking about her new car she getting ready to buy, and she's five years older than me. She's almost 80. We're still around and doing well. So do not count us out. That may be a business avenue for you. And that and that's funny you should say that because Ford's client base is mainly older. The bulk of Ford clients occur over 50, which is bizarre. Right, because right. young people are buying cars. Right, right. But older people are because they can afford fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. But here's the thing that was interesting when I was, I actually worked at one of their agencies. And the discussion is that the people who are going to buy the autonomous vehicles are mainly going to be older because they won't have to drive, but they still want to be able to have their freedom to get around. They don't want to do public transit. And so the autonomous vehicles are, are ideal for them. The problem is no one has figured out how to make sure that the cars do not get hacked because that's the problem. How do I create an infrastructure and set autonomous vehicles down the road and no one half them. You go, that's not a big deal. Yes, it is. I'll give you a good example. A couple of years ago, they had somebody attack refrigerators. Now, I had never thought about the refrigerator as being a computer. But most refrigerators now are connected to the internet and they have computer chips. So this entity, it was actually a crime ring who was experimenting, shut down one and a half million refrigerators so people could not even get into their refrigerator but they were testing the ability to hack. And so, the, so because we are now on the internet, everything has the capability of potentially being hacked because that's the new crime, is being able to get to your electronic information and whether I could hack your information and hold you ransom so that you pay me a ransom note or et cetera, that's really big business. Yeah. So, is there an Opportunity, since you say that, is there an opportunity in uh, uh, like pretty much like on-site data storage? There's opportunities in data storage. And particularly, you'll find there's a lot of data centers because a lot of the companies are moving away from their own data storage to centralized data storage. There's opportunities on um, cloud storage. There's opportunities on a lot of things that relate to anything that's related to the internet. The issue you have to ask, though, is what problem are people facing that can be solved very quickly? And I'll give you a good example of that. We discovered during the pandemic that there's all type of delivery companies that are available. Didn't realize there were so many. But people could see some time ago that people don't like to shop like they used to. They just want to shop online. They want the packages to come to them because it saves them time. So a lot of companies did very well in the pandemic because they solved the need of, of a problem, but they had to foresee the problem in order to be ready for the pandemic. And therein lies the dilemma as being able to foresee the problem before it actually occurs so that you can make the potential product or service so that when it does come, that you are prepared. So I say there's all type of opportunities out there. The question is, how, how do you make them? I use a good example and I had to laugh because someone was saying to me they needed to get some new glasses. But instead of, saying, <laughs> they, instead of going out to get the glasses, they actually took a photo of themselves and Ooh. they were gonna get their glasses fitted online. Really? That's insanity, but it happens, right? And then That's the how I buy my glasses. I've been buying my glasses like that for the last four years. See? They How come in that? and they're beautiful. How do you do that? What do you mean, how do you do that? You go online and you put in what kind of glasses you want, progressives, bifocals, sunglasses, whatever. They bring you up the designs of the frames. You pick the frame based on your face side and the kind of lens that you need. There's a little chart on the side that says, can you put this lens in? Yes, no. Once you do that, there's an upload. You take a picture with your phone, you upload it into the app 
full face forward without your glasses, and it tries the glasses on you. You can see a front view and a side view. When you look at your actual frames, there's a little button that says 360, and you click that link, and it will show you those glasses in a 360-degree view that you control with your touch, touch screen. And then you put your um, – you have to have your prescription. They have a place where you pop, uh, pop in the numbers to your prescription and send them to the company. They fix the glasses and send them back. That's what that Warby Parker is about that you see on TV where they said you can get five free frames. Well, the frames are free, but you've got to pay for those lenses. I've but seen that before. You, you go online and get your glasses to your face. And they I say round in. Though. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful, and it's quick. Hmm. And That's sometimes it's problem. cheaper. So it's my son... He buys his glasses that way too, and his, he pays hardly nothing for glasses. Right? Wow. You can get glasses for fifty nine dollars. I've been blind all this time yeah. for no reason. That's a dog thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. And like my son gets his glasses, he spends anywhere from like twenty thirty bucks. Well, he don't need bifocals, but the point is, he hit me to that, and I was like, wow. So you yep. get the prescription from the doctor to, to, in order to send it off? Yes. Yes. Great. Yes. I got one. I'm doing it. I'm in. <laughs> so but you see how technology makes our lives easier you can even now try on clothes that way um you know so you just have all type of things that are coming down the pike because of the technology but even something simple as um, i tell people like i'm running a school now when i ran my high school it wasn't as technological as my post-secondary school normally i would have needed 20 people to run a school Mm -hmm. But now I only have five because the technology with all of the robot process automations and things that happen, you can do <clears> so <throat> many things that you couldn't do before with less people. With less people. And so that's a reality in the function of, 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 of what's happening in the technological world. So, but the thing is you have to do a lot of reading. So what we have done on our, if you've never been on our social media, we actually post a lot of things on our social media about forward thinking technology. So if you go, whether to, you go to Twitter, which has the most, whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, we're posting things daily about future forward technology as it's happening. And if you haven't been there, go there. It kind of will save you some time on doing your research and say, well, let me see what's on the page. And then you can click the article, read the article, and then it gives you more information of where you can go to get the inf go find what's happening technological because we what's do the website so, um, our social media all goes by automation works so whether you're at facebook it's automation works and that's automation works w-r-k-z instagram same thing automation works twitter automation works and um linkedin same thing automation works so everything all of our social media is automation works with the TV and just go there and we're posting regularly. I think right now with um, Twitter and I have to chuckle because with the Twitter that's on an automatic posting feed and it gets 200 posts a day that we're doing and we're not posting them. It's happening by automation, you know, so you'll find a lot more information on, on Twitter than you probably went on the other social platforms mm -hmm. because we were able to figure out how we can make those automated posts, but go there and check out and see what all the different type of technology and things that are coming down the pike and it gets you ready and prepared so that you can kind of look three, four, five years down the road to complete something because that's where you, you meet the market is three, four years down the road and being able to present your idea to people because sometimes it takes them a while, companies a while to issue contracts. Okay, cool. Any other questions? I'm going to tell you the oh. thing that, that was exciting to me is just the whole age of the whole robot revolution, just in general. We just talked about Amazon, but there are so many things that are happening, like you have security guards that are now automated. You have um, all type of delivery trucks, like even Domino's has a delivery robot where they'll deliver your pizza without a human being. Mm. But notice what the theme is, efficiency, reduction of people. 
mm. efficiency, reduction of people. That is where the world is going. Now here where it gets scary, which is how we started our school, is that we had read a report by McKinsey and Company that says that 60% of the jobs that African Americans occupy today are going to be eliminated due to automation. Yeah. That's the scary part right there. Yeah. So my thing is you have to say to yourself, let me sit down and look at the manual jobs or jobs that a computer could probably do better or be more efficient. How do I get ahead of that curve so that I can make some money? Because it's coming and I use a good example. Automatic teller machines or ATMs. Mm -hmm. I remember, because I was at a bank, when the first ATM came out. People said nobody would ever use them. Mm -hmm. But today, a lot of people never go to their banks. They haven't seen a teller yep. in 10 years. Yep. And that happens all the time because it's efficient for the bank. But while it's eliminating that manual job, it opened up a whole bunch of jobs for people to manage the ATM machines. So one of the companies who's the leader in the management of ATM machines is called Bebold, D-I-E-B-O-L-D. -E and that's all they do all day, all over the world. 50 years ago, they didn't exist. And now there are a major corporation and all they do is manage and repair ATM machines. So while you have some jobs that you're losing, there are things that you gain as the economy is making a transition. One of the reasons we launch AutoWorks Insights is that we believe that the transition of technology is gonna happen faster. And we saw that during the pandemic. Notice industry didn't stop at all. It just went online. Mm -hmm. But it didn't stop whatsoever. It kept on rolling. And it forced a whole bunch of people at the same time onto the net in order to serve, be serviced because that's just the way that the business was running. Is it going to go back to normal? Never. Mm -hmm. Because now that they've seen an entire world of people go online at the snap of a finger, you're going to see that technology is just going to be rolling and that the cycles of innovation and invention are going to get shorter and shorter and shorter because it's going to bring efficiency and it reduces the human failure of people. But it also creates new jobs. Now I'm bragging because while we started cybersecurity, we started it because we saw a report that says three and a half million cybersecurity professionals are going to be needed by 2022. That's two years from now. And they're nowhere close to 3.5 million and they're struggling to find them. So to me, it's a grand opportunity for people to get into a new industry, make some money and be able to figure out how they can make goo gobs of money, open companies and do all types of things because where there's a shortage, where there's a high demand, that's where contracts are. And I believe that. The second thing that I noticed that was the bizarrest thing, I have been fighting with virtual education for at least almost two decades. Mm -hmm. And the education community has been very resistant to virtual education. Mm. But notice the entire world, pre-kindergarten through grad school, went to online education in a literally 30 days. Yep. Mine's on it too. Mm -hmm. 30 days flat all over the world. Mm -hmm. Now, most of them are doing it badly, but notice the transition, how it happened so quickly. Mm -hmm. yep. If I, if somebody had ever told me that, that I would see that happening, I would have said, nope. But it took a pandemic to make that happen and it happened in 30 days or less. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. That is impressive. And so you're going to see more and more of that happening because during the pandemic, we saw some things. Secondly, there was, I, there was a plant here 
that operated entirely autonomous. The owner operated it from his tablet through the whole pandemic. That's going to change the face of manufacturing. Or I went to Walmart and it must have happened overnight because they had 20 cashiers standing at a cashier booth. And when I went back literally the next week, they had replaced them with all self-service cashiers. In a week. Never seen things move that fast ever. But I think that it's going to continue in that grain. So that your question is to being able to get the information and to be able to say, okay, where do I predict it's going to go next? And either drive it that way or you link up with people who are driving it who can help you become a partner. Because let's talk real turkey. A lot of the technology that companies are creating, they are not creating themselves. Startups are creating them and they're becoming partners like the digit computer. That was not created by Ford Motor Company. It was created by a partner. A lot of the, the electric cars for Ford is created by Rivian, which is a partner. You got artificial intelligence that Ford just got involved in that's created by Agora. So there's lots of partnership abilities out there, but you gotta have some skills and you gotta have some technology that people want to partner with. And so companies are open. They're open to the fast moving startup who's getting to the, the finish line faster. But you gotta know where is that technology going? Where is the industry going? And how do you get there before everybody else does? Hoping is that not only will you review them, but you will share them with other people because this becomes a movement. Um, we have the ability in our community, particularly having just went through um, this whole George Floyd to transform mm -hmm. our, our community very quickly into the, a technological powerhouse, mm -hmm. particularly since the, the world community is sensitive to African-Americans and the plight that we face every uh. single day. So to me, this is a grand opportunity to do a lot of different things that we probably wouldn't have been able to do before mm -hmm. and be able to accelerate the process. The question is, what does your imagination tell you that you can do? Because that's the only thing that holds you back is your imagination on what is possible. Zoom went through the roof during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it even had its own glitches where it had failures. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it yeah. still survived. Yeah. Um, how do we get into cybersecurity? First of all, we, have, we actually run a Cisco Networking Academy that does teaching of, of cybersecurity. Um, and so I said to people, if you're interested, you can always go to our website, autoworks.org, make an application. We have virtual office hours, Monday night, Thursday night, and Saturday afternoons, where we meet with people and explain to them what our curriculum is like. And if it's something that they're interested in, we sign them up and we move forward. So if you want to just go to our website, um, Gabriella, that would be in applied. I would love to be able to meet with you. Cybersecurity, nobody is really good at it. It's too new. And most people don't even know what it is. And I'm speaking about from lay people all the way up to our representatives in Washington, D.C. We had several class junkets, let's call them, to the D.C. Um, area, to the government, to promote cybersecurity back in my graduate school days, which hasn't been that long ago when you're talking 2015, 2016, 2017. And um, most of them did not know exactly what it is. They knew it had something to do with computers and something to do with security, but not really. So I find that it is what you define it to be because there's so many specialty areas, so many niches that have not yet been explored, it's up to you to determine what it means. But it's across multiple, multiple industries. And I had a conversation about three weeks ago with someone at U of D. And I said, could you imagine having a pacemaker and somebody hack your pacemaker? Oh, and they stopped goodness. in the middle of their conversation and go, oh my God, I didn't even think about that. Could you imagine? Oh my goodness. And I hold you ransom and make you pay me a fee to turn your pacemaker back on? That's but a pacemaker is a computer. It has a computer chip. So it can be hacked. 
Hello. As much as your imagination is, that's where the industry can take you. So you just have to look at whether I'm interested in finances, I'm interested in automotive, I'm interested in healthcare. And with the technology, you can build your specialty and your career or your company around that industry. Because whether it could be fi fin financial tech, um, it with my healthcare, it could be work, it could be anything. But it's hair. based on your on your and so it's up to you to decide what you're interested in and then go do the research to say, can I find anything related to it? So next week, we're going to actually finish up on the top 10 list. We'll do six to 10. Um, we'll have some videos, bring some discussion. But if you want to do some homework on the top one through five, mm -hmm. um, you can do that and bring back some examples of things that you found that are related to the, the top one through five. And let's share them because I want people to talk about it, to get accustomed to it, to be that this is a mastermind group where we're, we're talking and we're thinking technology all the time. And then bring some friends with you.